ಸಹನಾವತು ಸಹನೌ ಭುನಕ್ತು ಸಹ ವೀರ್ಯಂಕರವಾವಹೈ ತೇಜಸ್ವಿನಾವಧೀತಮಸ್ತು ವಿಷಾವಹೈ ಓಂ ಶಾಂತಿ 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 So chapter 6 of Bhagavad Gita, which is being studied here, <coughs> is primarily a chapter on meditation, Dhyana Yoga. What it is, is that a meditation is generally going on in our mind, by default. the meditation that goes on by default is that i am a limited individual and that sense of limitation arises from an identification with the body mind complex meaning taking the body to be myself mind to be myself creates in me a sense of individuality because body mind are different from other body mind a sense of limitation because it is limited in time place so my perception of myself is i am a limited individual limited in time place attributes in vedanta teaches that that sense of liberation is what causes unhappiness in us and therefore there is constantly an attempt to become free from limitation so what we want is constantly striving to become free from limitation whatever we feel is limitation sometimes i feel that i am limited because i don't have enough money I want to be wealthy. Sometimes I feel I am limited because nobody cares for me, so I want to be somebody. From nobody to somebody, from not wealthy to wealthy, from unknown to known, from nobody to powerful. So this is a life of becoming. From what I am, to something else i want to become so that i'll be successful what is successful so that i become free from the sense of limitation so real success in life is to become free from limitation each one of us wants to be successful not knowing what we are seeking we think that by following the normal course or achieving the wealth fame power etc which the whole world is pursuing that will become successful that's the idea of success we have but there is not the idea of success that vedanta gives because happiness is key to success not success is not the key to happiness happiness is key to success <coughs> if all the success that we are seeking to achieve If it does not ultimately make me a happy person, then that success doesn't have a meaning in my life. So certainly Vedanta teaches us what is meant by success and how to live life which is in keeping with that goal of success. The means must be compatible to the end the road must lead to destination if success is the destination then my life also must become a journey towards the destination in that the sixth chapter also gives us certain insights in life we want to be happy so understand that number 1 happiness is success otherwise whatever is generally called success 
will not be success if it does not make me happy. So even after becoming successful, what I am seeking is seeking to be happy, not unhappy. So whatever I want ultimately, whether it is fame or power or wealth, the basic purpose behind those things is to be happy. So happiness is success. And therefore a way of life which is conducive to making me happy is a way of life leading me to success. So here, sixth chapter gives us a, a great insight. It gives definition of yoga. Tam vidya dukkha sanyoga vyogam yoga sannitam. Have you completed the whole chapter? But there is this statement in the sixth chapter, Tam Vidya Dukkha Sanyoga Vyogam Yoga Sangnitam. What is yoga? It's defined in the contrary language. That Vyoga is yoga. Yoga means joining. Vyoga means disjoining. Yoga means association. Vyoga means disassociation. So Lord Krishna says that this association from association with pain, this association from association with pain is yoga. Which means that we are born with association with pain. Dukkha Sanyoga. Sanyoga means association, joining. You are already joined with Dukkha. By default. That's called default, you know, that is there without our choice, which is given. Meaning that we are basically born as joined with, united with Dukkha. Our life should become a process of this union or this association with Dukkha. Well, of course, that's what we are doing all the time. Dukkha nivritti, avoiding Dukkha. Sukha prapti, Dukkha nivritti, attainment of happiness and giving up unhappiness, what we are trying to do. But unless we know what makes us happy and what makes us unhappy, if we don't have clarity about that, then it's likely that in the process of becoming free from unhappiness, we have created more unhappiness also. Or in the process of trying to reach happiness, we become unhappy, which is what we find is happening to human being. And so, Gita says, that you are already born with association with unhappiness. Which is what? As we said, that the primary perception that we have about ourselves is that I am a limited being. It is a sense of limitation which is the cause of unhappiness. This is a very important lesson to learn. So nothing else makes me happy other than my perception of myself that I am a limited being. Limitation automatically brings a sense of dependence, helplessness. I am limited. I am helpless. I can't control. I am under control. So every time I feel I am controlled, I, re I revolt. I try to control. If I am not allowed to control again, I feel frustrated. I want to control. If I cannot, I am frustrated. When I feel I am controlled, I revolt. So this is the struggle that is going on in life. So Lord Krishna says that understand that you are already born united in unhappiness. You really, Atma cannot be united with unhappiness. But this identification of the body itself is the source of unhappiness. 
Because we said right in the beginning, because body is very limited. And if I look upon my spouse's body, then I'm limited. So if dukkha or unhappiness comes from a sense of being limited, that means that it comes from this identifying with the body. Isn't it? Basically, limitlessness is my nature. Nothing can make me limited. But I feel that I am limited because I take this body-mind to be myself. So as long as that remains, as long as I continue to identify with my body or with my mind, regardless of what I do, I can never become free from a sense of limitation. Today what I am trying to do is to make this body bigger and stronger and make my mind more controlling, more knowledgeable, all kinds of things. I am trying to, as much as possible, I am trying to expand the powers of the body, the powers of the mind, the powers of the intellect. In that I may also go for some very esoteric things in the yoga and all kinds of spiritual powers I may want to attain. But regardless of what is done at the level of body or whatever is done at the level of mind, however powerful you make, it will still remain insignificant. As compared to total power, regardless of what power you get in body or mind, it is insignificant. Meaning that my attempt to become great by making this body great or the mind great, for the ego great, it is doomed to failure because in spite of how great it becomes, it will still remain insignificant. So Lord Krishna says that disassociation, meaning that become free from identification of the body. It is the identification of the body that creates in me a sense of limitedness and unhappiness. And therefore, the way to become happy is to become progressively free from identification with the body, mind. That's the way to be happy. So what do I do, Swamiji? I can't get, should I get rid of the body? Should I get rid of the mind? You can't. So life should become a process of progressively becoming free from identification with body-mind complex. That ego should become slowly and slowly less and less intense. And so, this is what Bhagavad Gita teaches in general and the sixth chapter teaches in particular. So what is meditation? As we see in that, constantly meditation is going on that I am limited. What should be my limitation? I am limit, I'm meditation, I am limitless. Therefore, focusing attention upon the self that is limitless. Yogi yunjita sadatam atmanam rahasisthitah ekaki yada chittatma nirashit. Lord Krishna says, Yogi satatam atmanam yunjita. May the yogi constantly focus his attention on the reality of the self. Right now, the way you perceive yourself is not the reality about you. Looking upon yourself as a limited being is not the reality about you. So you are making that the basis of life and then trying to become limitless. So there is no limitlessness is in your nature. Therefore, focus attention on that. So therefore, all this meditation in sixth chapter is meant for meditating upon or focusing attention upon the self, which is already limitless. And what different steps are being told? So sixth chapter is the chapter of meditation upon the self, which is limitless. But Swamiji, that's so difficult. Meditation upon the self is so difficult. My mind meditates only on the body all the time or the mind or the ego. 
Therefore, the earlier lessons also were given to make the mind meditation worthy. Lord Krishna calls that state Yoga Rudhattva. There is a word in, in the sixth chapter in the earlier verses, Yoga Rudhastha Dochade. That time this experience is called Yoga Rudha. Arud means mount. One is mounted on the yoga. As the yoga is like a horse. And mounting on the horse of yoga. Meaning being worthy of yoga, worthy of meditation. <coughs> So first of all, we should prepare our mind for being able to meditate. Otherwise, meditation efforts do not yield any result or they make more, more frustrated. Because the mind is not made ready to meditate. So this is one thing that is lost sight of. Everybody wants to meditate. Without, I mean, re- without recognizing that meditation requires preparation. Preparation in terms of making the mind free from distraction. So what is meditation? Meditation is maintaining a thought flow at the same time. Same time. Thinking of one object of meditation. Which means that the mind should be able to be free from all other objects of thinking. For that it should develop the ability to withdraw itself from other preoccupation and focus on the object of meditation. How do you do that? What makes my mind distracted? If I want to repeat Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, then I talk to Shiva and then Shivaram and Shivaram and my cousin and that's in Canada. It goes on and on. Either it becomes distracted with Rajoguna or Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, Tamoguna. So Rajoguna and Tamoguna take over. There are main obstacles. So Rajas means creates distraction and Tamas means case, you know, makes it drowsy. So mind should become sattvic. For meditation, ideally, mind should be sattvic. Yadahi nendriya arteshu na karma sthano shajyade Sarva Sankalpa Sanyasi Yoga Rudas Tadochade. Right in the beginning, Lord Krishna said, Sarva Sankalpa Sanyasi, when my mind becomes free from Sankalpa. Here translated as Ragadvesha. The mind becomes free from Ragadveshas, free from desires. Then it's called Yoga Rudha. Then the person becomes free or becomes capable of meditating. Yadahi nendriya arteshu, first of all, our attachment or fascination with sense objects should, be, you know, go. Mind is seeking sense pleasure. As long as it is seeking pleasure, it will go where this pleasure is available. And when I try to concentrate on Atma, there is no pleasure there. When I concentrate within myself, I don't find any joy to begin with. Therefore, mind runs away to where it finds joy. So only when the mind progressively becomes free from its fascination for sense pleasures, then it may stay inside. Yadahi nendriya Second thing that bothers us is, Swamiji, we have so many responsibilities and so many duties and so many things to do. I'll do this and I'll do that and so this is called karma or the duty, kartavya. This is another thing that is distracting. na karmasu anushajyade. When the mind does not become attached or concerned about the sense pleasure or about the various duties that I'm supposed to perform. Meaning a householder cannot meditate, that's what it means, duty. Householder means duty, is it not so? At least while performing meditation, I should not remain a householder. As Kaivalya Upanishad says, Atyashramastha Sakalendriyani Nirudya. You can you must transcend all the ashramas, not a brahmachari, not a grahastha, not a vanaprastha, not even nothing. While meditating, who am I? Not a grahastha. Not a father, 
not a mother, not brother, sister, husband, wife. Meaning that when I give up all these roles, in meditation, one does not play any role at all. I become a simple person. So right now, I am not father, I am not mother, I am not husband, I am not wife, I am not son. If son is meditating, then he will think of what a son is supposed to do. If father is meditating, then he is concerned about what a father should do. Husband is meditating, God knows what he is concerned about, you know. <laughs> so it's a tough job. So as long as I keep on identifying with those roles, so long my mind will naturally think of those roles because there is a concern. Father has a lot of concern. Mother has concerns, husband has concerns, everybody has concerns. And therefore, when my mind becomes free from all these concerns about duties, I have to do this, and I to, that's all given up. So first of all, the mind is free from its fascination for sense pleasures. What is going to be now in breakfast, and what is going to be in the dinner, and which movie is coming on Friday, which show is at 8.30, etc., etc. So, mind likes to think of those things, that's why it gets joy. So, one is freedom from those fascinations from sense pleasures. And second thing that occupies my mind is freedom from this sense of duty. Lord Krishna identifies these two sources of distraction. Yadahinendriyarteshu Na karma su anushadjade Sarva sankalpa Then try and then my mind will become free from all concerns. That requires preparation. Anashritaha karma phalam karyam karma karodhyah Sa sanyasi cha yogi cha na niragdir na chakriya Have you heard this verse? You are asking them. <laughs> no, but we are only twenty-nine, so by then first was it forgotten naturally. So Lord Krishna begins with this first verse. Of what kind of way, what attitudes are required in life to become meditation worthy? Meditation cannot be simply a one-time deal. That I meditate for half an hour, 45 minutes in a day. And for and the rest 23 hours or 23 and a half hours, I live a life which is totally incompatible to that. In half an hour, I'll basically do what I'm doing for the rest of the day, isn't it? You think the mind will be just, it's not a machine. The rest of the day I keep on thinking of the, all kinds of pleasures and then I half an hour I come and think of God. It can't do that, poor thing. So Lord Krishna says that our life also should be compatible to what it is that we want to do in meditation. And therefore this attitude is that are Life, active life, as we are living today, but with the right attitudes. What kind of attitudes? Attitudes that are conducive to make me free from this concerns about the mind. See, doing thing is one thing, I mean concern about them is another thing. Perhaps doing the duty also is not a problem. Performing actions is not a problem, not a big problem. But the concerns that I have, when I perform the action, first of all, primary concern is whether I'll be successful or not, whether I'll get what I want, I have purpose in performing action, whether the purpose will be served or not. That's very, con I'm concerned. I'm meaning that my action or my efforts will be successful. 
So I'm concerned about success. Lord Krishna says, give up that. Anashrita karma phalam. Meaning that when I do not, when the outcome is not important to me. Kadyam karma karodhya, when the effort is important to me. Meaning what I have to do is important to me. That I do what is right and, and avoid or refrain from taking the liberty to do what is convenient. Because doing right is not always convenient. Being honest is not always convenient. Being truthful is not always convenient. How old are you? People have a habit of asking embarrassing questions. <laughs> Even when a child asks me, Swami, what is your age? Why are you asking me? You know? What is for whatever reason this what is your age? Can I ask you some question? I say, yeah. Usually the first question is why do you wear, wear orange? But this fellow says, What is your age? <laughs> you know, that was very embarrassing to me. So I'm not supposed you're not supposed to ask me, this is a politically incorrect question to ask somebody's age, you know. And then not to be embarrassed in public, I'll, I'll give a convenient reply, which I think is conveniently how I should, how old I am supposed to be in the perception of others, not what I really am. But how old should I be? Then I think they will, he, they will think that he's okay. Oh, you're too old, so I'm easy. That's not good. That's all, you're so young, that also is no good. I should be right age, you know. So that should be my answer to that question. There is a convenient answer, may not be the right answer. And similarly also, constantly people keep on nagging us and bothering us. What is your salary? Where did you go? Who was calling on the phone? All the time, you know, impinging upon our privacy and our time and things that we don't care to share with others. And, and But then, Indian people have particularly this habit. So in our interaction with the people, with the world, we are very often confronted with situations that are rather embarrassing. And therefore, to, to avoid that embarrassment, I take the convenient way out. Just an example of how we do often what is convenient, then what is right. Why am I so concerned about telling them what I, how old I am? What my salary is? What is what? What's the big deal? No, no, no. My image is important. And so, I should be viewed in a certain way. I want people to perceive me in a certain way. I have a certain image. And therefore, I want to maintain that image before others. So I will put up a facade before me so that I look what I'm supposed to look rather than what I really am. So in general, this is what it is. The I, I play to the tune of the public image rather than what I really am. And therefore that requires me very often to make small compliments, not a big deal. We are not dishonest people, but little things here and there. Swami, so as far as big values are concerned, we follow them. I don't kill somebody, I don't, you know, hit somebody, etc, etc. But getting angry is a small thing, that uh, happens. In small things, you know, we think that you can take those liberties. But doing what is right, karyam karma, karyam karma is what is to be done. What is right in a situation is what the person does. But then doing right doesn't, may not have pleasant consequences. Doing right may have painful consequences and I want pleasant consequences. So when consequence becomes important then whether right or right doesn't remain important, you follow? When I do, I say something, I do something, if the consequence is important, then the means is compromised for the sake of the end. Then I am likely to take the convenient path than the right path. So Lord Krishna says, number one, that first thing is my commitment to do what is right. 
as I understand it. Meaning that what is right is what I have to decide, no doubt about that. But basically we all know what is right. You can make a mistake, that is understandable. Then we can learn later from the outcome that oh, I made mean, was not right decision, I can learn. But if I deliberately do something wrong, I can never learn. So, karyam karma karodhya, one who performs action, that is to be done, which is right action, which is my duty, what is expected out of me in a given, what is the response expected out of me in a given situation? I must act in my dignity. I am father, I act like this. I am a teacher, I act like this. I am mother, everything is a dignity. Mother cannot do this, my father cannot do that. Son cannot do this, wife cannot do that. Teacher is a teacher. Everybody always watches him. And whether he conducts himself or herself properly or not, they all watch. So when I take the role of teacher, I must do justice to that. Role of father, justice to that. Role of mother, justice to that. Meaning what? It means that we cannot afford to deliver ourselves in the hands of our temptations and our impulses. Isn't it? I am tempted, then I may take liberty and do something which is not right for a father or a mother or son or a swami or whatever, a disciple, guru. And so, and also if I get overcome by my impulses, then also I will do something that is wrong. So make sure that I'm not, my impulses do not control me. My temptations do not control me. My concern of outcome does not control me. And what I do is right. This is a big deal. So Lord Krishna says that we have to change our image first of all by acting in keeping with our true nature. So this is closer to true nature. Doing what is right is in direction of slowly owning up my true nature. Doing right is slowly becoming free from association with Dukkha. Because I do not realize that, I think that doing right creates Dukkha. If I speak truth, it will create Dukkha. It may, but it's called short term pain for long term gain. What is doing convenient? Short term gain, long term pain. So Dukkha Sanyoga Vyoga. All the time, Vyoga or disassociation with Dukkha. If we recognize what it is that causes Dukkha to me, that doing convenient or compromising what is right creates Dukkha for me. Falling for my impulses creates Dukkha for me. If I realize that, then disassociation with Dukkha is what? Doing what is right. Not submitting myself to the impulses, to the temptations. So this all conducive to dhyanam, you know. All of this is preparation for meditation. Because slowly I gain control over my mind. When there is a commitment to do what is right, then I cannot afford to do what is convenient, what my impulses tell me, what my temptations tell me, what my ragad vishas tell me. How to control them? Thus slowly I gain control over my mind. What is meant by control is that the mind does what I want it to do. Again, Lord Krishna says, right in the beginning, Atmaiva Hyatmano Banduhu Atmaiva Ripuratmana. Have you heard this? Atmaiva Hyatmano Banduhu Atmaiva Ripuhu Atmana. Says ourselves can our self can be our friend or our self can be our enemy. Our mind can be our friend, our mind can be our enemy. So when can I meditate? When the mind cooperates with me, is it not so? If the mind does not cooperate with me, regardless of what I do, I cannot meditate. Isn't it right? So for me to be able to meditate, the mind should be cooperative. I tell the mind, come on, Om Namah Shivaya, Om Namah Shivaya, mind says, okay, I'll do. Here, right now I tell my Om Namah Shivaya, mind has some other agenda. 
So mind is its own agenda. When does mind become favorable to me? When mind's agenda is the same as my agenda. And mind right now has its own agenda, which I slowly turn around, you know. So we are, by right values and attitudes, we slowly transform the mind's agenda and harmonize mind's agenda with our agenda. That's called mind becoming friend. Mind happily cooperates with me. Being accomplishment. Bandura atma atmanas tasya yena atma yo atmana jita hai anatmanas tu shatrutve varte atma yo shatruvada. Lord Krishna, when you say the mind is my friend, mind, which mind is friend? Which mind is enemy? Is this mind that is under control of Ragadvesha is my enemy? And mind which is free from Ragadvesha becomes my friend. So there is a life wherein there is a constant effort to make the mind free from Ragadveshas. Doing what is right, rather than what is convenient. Where karma phala, consequence is not important, the effort is important. Anashrita karma phalam, without resorting to karma phala. Meaning, don't, not, don't make karma phala as a means of happiness, make karma as a means of happiness. Don't postpone your happiness for the outcome, let the karma or the effort itself become the source of happiness. So how can you enjoy what you do? Cooking, how can you enjoy that? Oh, every day same, monotonous thing I do, office all the same thing I do. Every day. And I don't look forward to that also. Oh, again I have to go to work. Same thing. So we want to get over with the things. So I get my paycheck. The thing is that Work is a means of producing the outcome. The only way the work is looked upon is how can I get over with it so that ultimately I get my reward. Lord Krishna says, no. Let work become your primary source of happiness, not the reward. Anashita karma phalam. One who does not look upon karma phala or reward as the source of happiness, then where do I get happiness? Karyam karma kairodhya. By doing the karma properly, make karma itself the source of satisfaction. That's the change. Meaning that looking upon karma phala is joining with unhappiness and seeking gratification of karma is disjoining from unhappiness. You understand? The karma phala I don't, I cannot control, uncertain. And so if I depend upon that, in all likelihood, unhappiness. Karma is what I can control. If I make that a source of happiness, then I become disassociated with unhappiness. So what is the pattern of life? Constant effort to disassociate it from unhappiness and join with happiness. We should know what makes me unhappy and what makes me happy. So Lord Krishna teaches, we don't know. He says, your association with, your identification with, all the importance you give to the karmafala is the cause of unhappiness. So then what should I do, Swamiji? Lord, we asked him, he says that you identify with karma. That's how the motivation changes. Join with happiness. That's how the mind slowly becomes free from Raga Dvesha. Sarva Sankalpa Sanyasi. Mind is free from Raga Dvesha. Yoga Aruda. Then it's called Yoga Aruda. <coughs> then we become meditation worthy. That doesn't mean we should not meditate. Now, Swami, does it mean that should I wait for my mind? No, no, we don't have to wait for the time when mind will become totally free from Ragadvesha. Hopefully during the day there is some time when the mind is not yet taken of Ragadvesha. That's why they ask us to meditate in the morning. That if you had a good sleep and mind has rest at that time, 
Ragadvesh is not, attack of Ragadvesh has not yet come. Swamiji, I do everything before the whole family wakes up. Once everybody gathers, it's gone, you know, then nothing is in my hand. So still things have not attacked me. I still enjoy a certain freedom of myself. Then it's possible to have a little space for myself where mind is free from anxieties and concerns. Use that for meditation, no doubt. But in general, our constant attempt is to release the mind from the hold of these ragadveshas, to bring it under our control, <coughs> so that it does what I want it to do. Then alone meditation is possible, basically. <coughs> and then meditation is disengaging from identification with the body, etc., and identifying with the Atma. Atma samsam manakrutva, Nakinji, Lord Krishna will say that concentrate the mind in the Atma. And that's your goal. So, really, success in life is more inward looking I become, more free I become from unhappiness, and more successful I am. Less unhappiness means more success, or more happiness means more success. The moksha is the success that will come someday. We need not wait for that day to be happy. Every moment can be happiness when I have the right values and attitudes. That's one thing. And of course, we should have a slot of time when we can follow what Lord Krishna says. Yogi yunjita satatam atmanam rahasisthitaha that in solitude, free from all company, free from all possessions, free from all desires, free from all agenda, you know. So, when I start meditation, number one, that I tell myself, am I a mind, no agenda. Vedantic meditation is very good. Because during, from this meditation, we don't seek to achieve anything. It is the achievement of what is already achieved. In fact, what I want to achieve is myself, which is already there. And therefore, mind relax. You have nothing to achieve. Nothing, because the way the success thing comes there also. A usual orientation of seeking success will come in meditation also. I'll make meditation as a means of success. So what did I got for meditation? That again, that will be another thing. He says, no, no. Nothing is to be achieved because you are the achievement. You have all agenda. Nirashi yadachit. Nirashi means no asha, no desire, no agenda. Give up all agenda. Remind what Vedanta teaches us that I'm already limitless, I'm already whole, I'm already complete. And there was nothing to accomplish, nothing to worry about. Mind calm down, relax. So relaxation itself becomes meditation when the mind is free from agenda. Free from all concerns. Become a sannyasi during meditation. Because then only you don't have any possession and no connection. Otherwise moment, I mean in life a lot of connections are there. In the time of meditation, no connection, no possession, no agenda. That is a frame of mind that we create for meditation. Upon the self, Chidananda Rupa, Shivoham. But I said, meditation itself is means of success. But preparing my mind for meditation also is means of success. Because that preparation makes me happy, creates happiness from within. <coughs> so first is right attitudes and values. Which is what prepares the mind. Then you can tell the mind, no agenda, mind says no agenda. Or I tell mind, no agenda, mind says no, no, I have so much agenda. So making the mind favorable to us, our friend, 
that is the first project and lord krishna also says there yukta har viharasya yukta cheshtasya karmasu yukta swapna avodasya yogo bhavati dukkha dukkha remove of pain when there is alertness and moderation in our life yukta har viharasya be moderate in your food as well as in movement yukta cheshtasya karmasu be alert in all movements and be moderate yukta swapna avodasya moderation in sleep moderation in keeping awake moderation in eating moderation in fasting moderation in walking be mindful be alert always maintain those boundaries remain moderate that's how mind is trained to be with me natyasnata suyogosti nacheekanda manasthata nacaati swapna shirasya jagrato nahi bacharjuna he arjuna when a person who is eating too much he can't meditate not eating at all cannot meditate sleeping too much cannot meditate not sleeping at all cannot do avoid all those extremes and the middle path that's called path of moderation it's an important dis- discipline in life then we have to be careful in everything how many cups of tea what is the size of the cup of the tea how many chapatis how much time for tv how much time for what is it you know <laughs> social media lord krishna doesn't say don't do it don't starve yourself At the same time don't indulge neither starving nor indulging this is called middle path path of moderation so you can do what is necessary to be done with moderation so tv for x amount of this much time facebook for this much time whatsapp for that much time movie for this much time boundaries speaking this much too much speaking no good don't you doesn't say don't speak at all but be alert when you are speaking a yogi is always alert yoga means being alert anudvegaram so when you talk make sure that your words do not hurt the feelings of the other person to whom you are talking swam you very zen to that people get hurt whether they get or not so is it like that they always gets hurt and we dismiss that and we don't take the responsibility but lord krishna says when you are speaking be careful that your words do not hurt other person meaning take the feelings of their feelings into account the sentiments into account respect them respect the feelings and sentiments of other people be sensitive to them then only we will refrain from hurting them speak truth whether convenient or not you don't have to speak when you say speak truth doesn't mean you have to speak you don't have to speak truth but if you speak then you speak truth you follow this is a very convenient escape we have that if you think that it is not convenient to speak truth the refrain from speaking if you choose to speak then speak truth you can choose not to speak sahadev would never say anything if you ask him he knows everything in his mind everything he knows if the pandava had asked him would have told them that there is this is you know there is an escape route he knew that in the lakshagraha you know this one was there they, they, they were all all of a sudden set to fire they, then finally they asked hey, do you know he said yeah yeah i know we have to go out this what is but so far it didn't say anything you know he will say only when he is asked
we have you know we are so much inside that we are just it's so much pressure inside that we have to say things shall i say your turn is not come keep quiet say if necessary and speak what is true so if necessary so this alertness in day to day living yukta cheshtasya karmasu if we are alert and aware full of what we are doing you do what is to be done and not what is not to be done all unnecessary activities have to be avoided unnecessary movements have to be avoided unnecessary talking is to be avoided then then unnecessary thinking then will be avoided right now thinking is not mine in, in my control I can control what I can control. Speech I can control. Movement I can control. Activities I can control. Food I can control. Wherever karma is involved, there is the karthrutva, meaning there I have the freedom to control. Wherever is freedom, control. Control doesn't mean you starve yourself, or deprive yourself. Meaning always have the boundaries. No indulgence. <clears throat> so Lord Krishna says live life like that. So living life alertly with sense of proportion with moderation with right values with right attitudes all of this is a preparation for meditation. If this is not there then our mind for 23 and a half hours the mind is liberal to do whatever it wants to do and for half an hour you expect it to you know do what i want that difficult and so all of our whole day activities become the means of bringing the mind under control so living must be compatible to what you want to do <coughs> so the lessons from the 6th chapter how to make like successful that was the question how can we use a lesson of six chapter to make like su- life successful right successful always remains but life cannot be made successful unless we have the right understanding what success is happiness is success and what source of happiness self is the source of happiness how can i get that by making the mind inward how does that happen when the mind is free from the hold of raga dveshas which pull it away from myself how do i do that by doing what is right by being alert by being moderate by maintaining boundaries in talking walking eating in all activities so the desire to meditate must reflect in all of this and the yogi is always the person has a master over himself control over himself not a restraint i mean not control doesn't mean that you are a very uh, you know a very serious person in the sense that uh, all the time uh, no no i uh, controlling doesn't mean that you have to punish yourself or you have to starve yourself means refrain from indulgence moderation okay any questions samajay hmm. i have a in fact it's a couple of questions so thank you so much for making it a lot more practical real mm-hmm. in terms of what this yoga is how we are out so the question is then is there even a goal or a point called realization to me from what you are saying is the attitude how you kind of approach all this that's what is realization and then the connected question is when you ask someone a uh, given example of who is a realized soul which itself might not be the which might not even exist the examples given is uh, janaka swami ramana maharishi now they are all still like an abstract level so someone at a grahastha level to kind of 
have someone as a role model of who's maybe in your particular example it's not even who's a relay soul but who's kind of uh, taking the proper attitude towards life it will be good to kind of understand who would be role models to emulate well number one don't worry about role models lord krishna describes how a person should be so role model means that we are uh, burdening somebody with the performance that we expect from them so we have an idea of what a real life soul should be and that this is a role model then you keep watching oh but i think no this is not right that's not. so then uh, we are burdening somebody with kind of the values that we impose so i personally don't look for role models between you and me i look at the gita describes yeah so whether somebody is there or not i don't care because you guys are ramana majid and somebody who is ramana majid and somebody different people different ideas or nobody there is nobody who says universal acceptance lord krishna also made universal acceptance how did in mahabharata they did this and then etc etc rama he decided you know, abandon his wife there is no i don't think you can find anybody at all who can meet all expectations of all the people because that is how we know how to judge a person so then cons- looking upon somebody's ideal and then dis- being disappointed because we are then burdening that person with our requirements but lord krishna gives enough description of what a role model is dukkheshwar udvigna varaha the sixth chapter also says <coughs> and so uh, sixth chapter says a very beautiful practical thing also atma upamyena sarvatra samam pashyati yorjuna sukham vayadi va dukham sayogi paramo matah lord krishna is going to become parama yogi not just yogi parama yogi then do this one simple thing treat the other person as you treat yourself now that you don't have to look for anywhere else you know you don't need any idea you become the idea you try to treat other person as you treat yourself atma upamyena atma becomes a basis in interacting with anybody in what way how would i treat myself or how would i have liked to be treated if i was in that position simple how how do i treat myself always i always want to make myself happy and never want to make myself unhappy very simple rule about myself isn't it then my ideal should be to make others happy and not make them unhappy a tough job but the thing is so lord krishna gives us a sort of a, a guideline how to become a yogi how to gain total mastery of oneself by this simple thing if you don't do any pranayama do nothing just do one thing in every situation i place myself in the position of other person and ask the question how would i have liked to be treated if i was in that position suppose you did something wrong would you like to be punished or like to be forgiven what do you like forgiven forgiven yeah. then what should i do to others <laughs> you like somebody to be kind to you or cruel to you kind to you so the, so this becomes if you already have a role model what's the role model how i expect to be treated by others you follow that's the role model and i should model myself according to that i'm pretty far away right now but it tells me what the role model is what's the role model what how i expect to be treated by others i want others to be kind to me not cruel want them to forgive me not punish me want them to be honest with me 
not cheat me, want to tell me truth, not misguide me, right? Simple, basic, I mean expectations are there, that's all. This basic expectation we try to fulfill. You become perfect. Sayogi Parma Madha, Lord Krishna says, he becomes Parama Yogi. So you talked of realization is, is a process. It's not a one-shot deal. Even the people may want to describe it as one-shot deal. It's, we, we describe the whole process, how it leads to that. Yes, sir. Just to elaborate on what you said, I seem to get in trouble very often treating others the way I want to be treated. For example, I like to spend 18 hours of the day doing some activity. And the other guy wants to sleep 18 hours. So I've learned, seems like it is better to treat others the way they want to be treated, and now not how I want to be treated. I want to share what I learn, other, ones, other person wants to be quiet about what they learn. I want others to come to my home without, you know, an invitation. But I can't go to the house because they would say, listen, leave me alone, I don't want to be. Okay, can you elaborate on how to treat others the way they <coughs> want to be treated rather than how you want to be treated? See, what you described is that you want to be active 18 hours a day. Other person wants to sleep. So if you try to encourage him to work, then he gets upset. But this is a reverse thing. We are saying that you place yourself in the position of that person and then ask, if you were in that position, how would you like to be treated? If you are in the position of that person who likes to sleep, then you would have liked to be treated. How? To allow, allow, let me sleep. You follow? I place myself in the position of that person, not what I expect from him. Not what I like that I want them to do. What I would expect if I was in that position to be respected. I like to sleep. I don't like to share. I don't like to talk. I want privacy. Give them. That doesn't mean you have to do that. He wants privacy, you need not have, you need not want privacy. But when you interact with that person, respect. Yeah. So my conflict question was this, which is uh, going back to your earlier uh, uh, preface. Most of our drive is based on the fact we want to come out of the so-called sense of limitation. We mm. want to be doing something because we feel we are limited. Although it is spiritually or Vedantically <coughs> speaking, it seems the cause of all evil, that seems to be the essence of the, how the world functions. Because if somebody doesn't want to do that, it goes into inaction for the most part. So to me it sounds like liberating yourself and wanting to be limitless may not be as much of an evil as long as it is not a binding uh, drive to be limitless, if I make sense. So it looks like if everybody <coughs> draws and says, oh, it is it is not my job, let me be, I'm limitless anyway, so why should I do any more, and have that sense of full fullness, I'm wondering if the world will become like a sandstone place with no action at all. Number one, that you cannot will and say that I will not do anything. Not doing is not in your control. It is your mind that will compel you to do things anyway. To not do is a great achievement. To remain without doing something is a great achievement. Lord Krishna says that a person cannot remain inactive and for a moment, but as long as there is this restlessness inside, discomfort inside, that will force you to do something. And so world cannot remain inactive even if the world wants. If inactivity is in terms of inner peace, that will become free from need to act, then that is what we want. It is not not acting. It is becoming free from the need to act. Understand the difference. 
normally a person cannot remain inactive even if the person wants because the discontent and the restlessness or discomfort that the person feels within forces the person to do things. And therefore, not doing, remaining inactive is not our choice. For you to create that choice. When can you remain inactive? When you discovered a contentment within yourself. So it is not inactivity. It is freedom from the need to do activity. Inactivity is only tamas. If somebody doesn't do something, it is tamas. And people are doing that not just because they are not doing, they are forced to do things. Most people do not choose to do things, they are compelled to do things. Is it because he is not content. He is not happy with himself and that force him to do something. So I, when will you be without any activity? When you have found contentment with yourself. If the inaction is the result of inner contentment, then that's what we want. If the world gets that, the whole world will be happy. Activity is for the sake of activities. Nobody wants. You want it for only happiness. If you have it, then why do you want to disturb it? Atma samsam, if you discover the happiness within, don't, don't do anything. And so, uh, you will not need to do anything. It is not not doing. It is freedom from the need to do. That means, it is discovering contentment with oneself. Now you can ask a question, if everybody is contented, what will happen to the world? To be contented cannot be willed. You cannot will. Yes, I am contented, Swami. You cannot be. It has to happen. Contentment is a great achievement. It has to happen. It is not by will. So just by declaring I am content, you don't become content. They even declare I am happy. If I can will being happy, who will want to be unhappy? And happiness comes anyway. And so nothing will happen to the world, don't worry. But the thing is that it is not inactivity in terms of tamas, inactivity in terms of sattva. We both look extremely, both those extremes look alike. One is incapable of doing something, other one is free from need to do something. Big difference. So like, did you extending the same thing? Like desireless. Doesn't it lead to being goalless? Like I, I, I don't want to desire myself, which will bring some kind of conflicts in me, <coughs> trying to achieve it, that puts the pressure, uh, pressure on me. So I live a life goalless, because I'm not, I don't want to desire anything. Then I, uh, my life will have no meaning. As I say, you don't have freedom to be without desire. Desire doesn't seek your permission, it comes. You can't be desireless, even if you want. Can you be? Desires come anywhere. So, desirelessness is not by will. Just as contentment is not by will, it's an achievement of becoming free from rajas and tamas. Same thing is desirelessness. Desire has to happen. I have, I have no desire, Swami. I am giving all desire. You cannot give up desires. Because desires have caught you. When can you give up something? When you have freedom to give up. It is like saying, you know, that uh, <laughs> these two sadhus are standing on the bank of the Ganges in winter, shivering. <clears throat> and they see one blanket floating in the stream. So one of these was very bold and he plunged into the river in that cold water and he swam all across and then, you know, caught hold of that blanket. But unfortunately he started also sweeping, being swept with the blanket. So the other fellow was saying here, hey, come on, give up that blanket, come back here. He says, I don't know, it is not a blanket, it is a Himalayan bear, it has caught me and therefore I can't give it up. When can you give, if you are caught something, you can give up. If you are caught, desires 
is it like that bear has caught me so i can't give up unless i grow within myself all giving up happens simply not by will you cannot give up anything i'm giving it up that's just a word or lip service giving up is something that has to happen not something that is by will how does it happen when i discover the compensation from myself what satisfaction i was getting from here is what i get from within then only i can give up that and if you give up that fine we will we'll welcome you if you give up something because you are content with yourself that's all you want that's called sita prajna or in the direction of sita prajna atmaniv atmana tushtah one is completely content with oneself that's a great achievement the extent to find extent to which you find contentment is an achievement so again don't worry nobody can become desireless and also you have uh, other question you uh, answer for uh, on this question when you said like respect to this question comes to children they do or uh, uh, extended time on uh, say phone or something else so only children <laughs> <laughs> that's where I'm, my focus is on now <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> So we in we impose on them saying okay don't do this don't do that sometimes we get strict and hurt them and all that but both of them are good yes so is it let them let them uh, continue with what they're doing is leading them to a destruction imposing they seems the right thing to do though they that's not what they want but I can't give them what they want because it's not right thing to do so what is right in that case what is good for them you do not what they want what is good for them because as parent it is a responsibility to do what is good for them and so uh, you come you decide what is good for them sorry hmm. question uh, as a, as an extension of that hmm. in the same uh, chapter 6 we just want to be explaining about meditation he says as we explain the mind goes towards sensory objects and pleasure that is one different distraction for uh dhyana or meditation and he quotes shankara and says achinkara says it's very difficult to pull the mind back because it can cause a tension to you instead dwell on the object and recognize the satya in it not the mithya and then it automatically comes back to the self But in a situation like this, where the mind goes towards uh, a concern, like a child, a parent-child relationship, you see the child doing something, but during the course of meditation, that thought comes up and causes a source of distraction. How do we recognize that? Yeah. Right now, I am not father. <laughs> right now, I am not performing any role. No. So If you are a father, all concerns will come. Yes. You cannot remain far. You cannot be father without any concern. Why? Where is father? So, he is giving up desire. He is Vesha. You cannot give up desire. How can you give up desire? Thinking of giving up desire can be. Vesha. Thinking of. Giving up the desires. Give away. <coughs> See, you cannot give up the desire. What we have to do is to understand the desire. What is the cause of desire? and remove the cause desire is an effect effect can go only when the cause goes like the weed is an effect you have to pull it out only you pull the root the weed will come back so desire is like a weed it is a re cause so remove the cause then only it will go what is the cause in a lack or want that's the cause and that goes only by undertaking this process of discovering inner satisfaction by being a contributor rather than being a consumer this attitude that we talked about is a slow process which progressively enables us to discover inner contentment to that extent things automatically drop not related to chapter 6 only but general question uh, that 
when I talk to him, mm. I get a per- not him, but any gentleman, but anybody. I see. A, I have a perception, a perception of the person, with the perception I speak, but in the in the process I miss out what I'm supposed mm-hmm. to do. Mm-hmm. So how to avoid that? You speak to the person according to the perception you have of the person. Yes. What else can you do? So generally that, that, okay, when, I, when I'm talking to somebody at work or anything, right, like I know, this guy's an idiot, whatever he says, he's going to be wrong. So I immediately yell at him before he speaks up. But that you judged. This is not, yes. yeah, that judgment is not right. Perception, assessment is right. Judgment is not right. You assess the person that this is his intellectual level. Idiot is a judgment. He does everything wrong is a judgment. The reality is that this person has this, this limitation of understanding, of grasping, or whatever. You know, take them to account and then uh, deal with the person. No, he is usually, he can't do anything, that's all right. Then see what you can do. You can still be kind to that person. Even the person is idiot, you can always be kind to that person. He will dismiss that person in mind. Or we, uh, act, you know, have an air of superiority. Or dismiss that person as no good. That's, that's not right attitude. Because I would not want to be treated in that way. We can always be kind. Even the person, it's not what is false. That he is idiot. You know, what can you do? It's not by choice that you are idiot, is it? No. You happen to be. If idiot is really a person, he is not what I am saying. Is, this, by, by idiot you mean that he is not smart enough. He is not intelligent enough. He doesn't have enough grasp. It's not by choice. That's why you find yourself to be. So my approach should be our approach, can I help him? If he is not able to do something, is it possible for me in some way to help so that uh, he can do something? If he is a team member, for example, then dismissing that person, you lose him completely. If our approach is that, that this person has some difficulty, Difficulty, intellectual difficulty or emotional difficulty sometimes. People have emotional problems also. The life at home may not be very conducive. But so many emotional things that also somebody is late, you know, he's an idiot. But that, that we have to look, why this fellow is late? Why is not in mood? Why is he not applying himself? Is it intentionally he doesn't want to do or is not able to do? Maybe there are some difficulties. You follow? So we may have perception without taking into account what, what causes that person to behave that way. This story I have told, and some of you may have heard, which I read someplace, is an a, a, is, is episode in the uh, New York subway. Uh, it's almost, yeah, so a, almost empty compartment was there and then only a few people were occupying the seats. At a given station, when uh, one man, middle-aged man, with two young boys entered that. And two, these two youngsters were very rowdy. They just came in and they started running around and then banging into somebody, collying into this. People got fed up in five minutes. Come on, why don't you control these children? What are you, don't you see what they're doing? Their father was not doing anything. So when people just express, you know, their anger, then the father says, uh, I'm sorry for what they're doing, but we are just coming from hospital, where this boy's mother just died, and we are coming from there. Moment this came, we understand what is making them, automatically your attitude changes. So understand that a person has difficulty. Why a person is what it is, is because of difficulty. Even if a child is indulging, that is a difficulty. Everybody has difficulties. And therefore, we have to also address that difficulty. Not simply restrain the external thing, which may be required, you know, at a given point in time. But the ultimate solution is to understand, be sympathetic, be kind, 
understand what makes them what they are and that we can help them that should, that should be our role ideally <coughs> Karma, the source of happiness or success, not karma phala. Um, at work, success is, is generally measured by results or karma phala. How, how does one interpret this? Right, so we have to respect the norms. And it is understandable that the world only measures you by your performance. <coughs> That's the only objective criteria that they have. Your attitude towards karma is a subjective thing which is not quantifiable. So only way they can measure is by performance. So we respect that. Not that we do not give importance to performance. We don't judge ourselves by performance. We judge ourselves by the effort. Yes, sir. Uh, of the several pearls which I gathered today from you, one of the things which I can relate to and I've been pondering on is yoga and yoga association and the dissociation. I've been very blessed for the last six years to be with a bunch of people who are pursuing reading Gita and so forth. And if I were to ask myself, where is the biggest paradigm shift? Where have I started you know, changing myself based on this journey? It seems to me a little uh, primitive or counterproductive. I used to depend more on my intelligence, asking questions, why, what, I seem to think now, I'm almost praying God to give me less of that intelligence. Because once I take away that intellect of worldly curiosity, I seem to become a better person. It seems to me that the intelligence gathered by my other journey, the worldly journey, has already clogged up my mind and soul. And when I give away that and I say, I'm not going to ask a question who this guy is, where he is coming from, what is his designation? What is his? In other words, I almost find a bliss in ignorance and not letting my intellect be intellect. So the yoga or the dissociation of the BMI seems to be almost like being a grown-up man becoming a child. Uh, and you know, as ch children are, you know, very naively nice to everybody, uh, the worldly baggage, for lack of a better word, seems to hinder my spirituality. I was just curious. That's a normal evolution, or I'm going in the wrong direction. Well, you see, what you call intelligence, they're asking question: where is it coming from? What is what? No, this is all snooping. This is not really intelligence. My question is: why am I concerned about that? Intelligence would be this: why am I asking this question? Why am I concerned? You, there may be need to be concerned. I'm not saying that. You need, need, but very often it is a habitual snooping. So I have to ask my mind, why do you want to know that? After knowing that, what do you get? So maybe it may have become the habit of the mind. It's so called curiosity. It's not so much curiosity. It is always trying to, you know, sneak into other people's life or something. Which uh, may have no reason or is some complex on my part sometimes to feel that I am better than others, I am, you know, I am, so somehow trying to uh, judge or trying to arrive at the conclusion that the other fellow is no good or not good enough and I am better than that. Something, some complex is involved when my mind asks, where is he coming from, what is he talking about? My question to my mind would be, why do you want to know that? So this is not intelligence. This is just uh, cu misplaced curiosity. Intelligence can be to understand that person. If you are interacting with the person, where is the person coming from? Not place, but where, what is his level of understanding? What is the intention? What is the agenda? Where is he coming from? And how to respond to the person? So if your mind is stopped asking those things, yes, that's a progress. But that was just idle questioning. It was not really questioning leading to any kind of understanding or an, um, knowledge. I mean, I think you 
said nicely, but I am thinking of something a little less trivial than that. And uh, my understanding or what I am trying to gather from that is that I don't, I am not able to have the faith and surrender required. I am somewhat paranoia about things. For example, it could be something like my daughter or my friend's son comes and says, I want to marry that person. And I say, how nice is that person? How good is this person? Is that person taking care of my daughter or son? Should be the right question. Instead, what's his job? What are the parents? So it, it may not be trivial in the sense, I'm not able to have the faith and surrender saying that whatever my daughter picks is going to be right, whatever the prasada which the Lord gives my daughter will be okay. So I become, I'm not sure if um, I'm curious for trivial reasons, uh, it's just that I'm curious because I'm not able to do the surrender and faith required. And that surrender and faith is not coming because of my so-called worldliness. If intelligence is probably not the right word. No. Now, when your daughter wants to get married to somebody, I think it should be appropriate on your part to know that person. What is he doing? What is his job? What is his salary? What is his background? What is his culture? Upbringing? Whatever you can know. Just to see whether there is compatibility or not. As a father, it's your duty. If they don't allow you to do that, then you can pray for them. Sometimes they are father, then none of your business. They can tell you. So, I know what I am doing. You don't have to worry about that. <laughs> then all right, you are shown your place, then you leave that. But otherwise, as a father, it is certainly your responsibility to try to see as much as you can whether or not there is compatibility, that your daughter is going to the right place, what is the probability of being happy, father has to see. That curiosity is, is not curiosity, there is investigation. It is not idle curiosity. An investigation leading to your judgment. So assessment is required before you can come to a judgment and whether this is right or not. Your daughter or son may or may not respect your judgment or you may not even express your judgment. You come to your judgment, finding a right moment, you can say, my child, you know, this is what I think. So you may look into that. Says, not that I know better. Thank you. God bless you. But certainly, as father, there is a responsibility. If the neighbor's daughter is doing something, where is he coming? On? That is curiosity. But when my daughter is doing something, that is investigation. Because that's part of my responsibility. <coughs> That is a very good question when I am not, so you are asking that I should be kind to others and I should be respectful to others. But when others are not kind to me, they are not respectful to me, when they hurt my feelings, then what should I do? Especially wife. Hmm? Especially wife? You say spouse. Why do you say wife? So then, what is expected out of us is something very demanding. But what is expected out of us is try to be forgiving to that person. When somebody is hurting us, to forgive that person is the only way to become free from hurt. How can I forgive this person, Swamiji? He is not kind to me. He is not respectful to me. <coughs> But not being kind and not being respectful to somebody else is our problem. We don't realize that. When I call this for idiot, it, uh, no, that, that shows some problem within me also. Something inside me that prevents me from respecting the other person. Some kind of arrogance, some kind of a sense, you know, so which prevents me from respecting other people. So maybe that person does not respect me as his problem of arrogance, insensitivity, or many pe people when they themselves are disrespected, then they disrespect others. 
So maybe that person also is being treated by others in that manner. And he finds, and he's looking for avenues where he can do that, to relieve his burden, you know. So some of these possibilities are there. So here, the attempt is, rather than looking at the behavior of the person, if you can look at the person behind the behavior, then we may find that that person also has own pain and own problems, which is what makes a person behave like this. Usually, whenever somebody inflicts pain upon somebody, physical or emotional pain, that always comes from inner pain. No happy person will cause pain to somebody. We also cause pain to others when we get angry. That means when we are in pain, that pain comes out as anger, then we wind up hurting somebody. So, if we look at that person's you know, when we are by ourselves and mind is quiet, then we can... Why is the person behaving like this? Then there are so many psychological reasons can be there, you know. There's some... But why he treats me only like that, not others. Then some transference can be there, you know. Maybe when he was growing up, his sister treated him in a certain way. And when he looks at you, he looks at his sister, you know. Some transference happens, all kinds of things, that we don't know all those things. The pain point is, something, some problem is inside, that's all I can say. What it is, we don't know. Because we may not know enough about that person to know exactly what causes him to behave like this. But it's not happiness that makes him behave like this, for sure. Some kind of unhappiness alone makes him behave like that. And if I can sympathize with unhappiness, then I may be able to, you know, that, that will reduce the shock of that behavior. Sometimes you are compelled to react in some situations. Uh, you may not be able to ignore. No, you don't have to ignore. You have to protect yourself, not react. You have to protect yourself. Meaning you are right that you try and not to, I mean, try and not to let that person hurt you. Yeah. It doesn't mean that we become object of other people's, uh, you know, misbehavior. All we can say is that we are sympathetic to this misbehavior and then respond as you need to. This is just the attitude. When you respond with that attitude, your attitude will be more real than if you respond out of anger or frustration. Then it will be more hurtful be behavior. So yes, out of sympathy also, you can show him the place that this is where you are. You are you, this, this far, no further. You can show the boundaries and we have to do that. <coughs> is that the path or the Shisha should uh, select a guru? Now, there are examples in history where gurus have selected the Shishas for the tradition. But now it seems that uh, based on uh, things or attitude or uh, certain sects that are followed, people select the rules. What, what is the balance thing that, or what should be the ideal thing? Ideal thing that it should work out, whoever selects whom. Ultimately, that relationship takes place. You cannot will a relationship anyway. You cannot will that this is my guru. You follow? Otherwise it will work out well. If someone becomes your guru because you will that he is your guru, that will be easy. But it has to happen. It's like falling in love. You cannot will. If we can will by to love, then no problem with spouse, no problem anywhere. So it is like that. It has to happen. And you have to try to uh, create situations where something like that can happen and you discover a guru. Not this I made the guru but I don't think the making business can work. So Arjuna discovered a guru in Lord Krishna and a shishya in himself. Then he fell at the feet of the teacher. Yeah. This is a kind of a generic observation. 
I think it seems like the world is trending towards bringing the moon closer for the neighbor father. How far? The neighbors seem to go further. Mm. <laughs> the moon seems to become closer. Mm. The road seems to be wider, but the mind is becoming narrower. Mm. Houses are becoming larger, the family is becoming smaller. So, technology is becoming sophisticated, but I don't think we are using necessarily to be humane, we are becoming more robust. So, from your vantage point, looking at the evolution, do you really think this is progress? Because it is, it is the nature of our life to get inculcate what we are seeing around. And to me, it sounds like if you are intuitively following what's happening around, we are not really progress. What's your thought on that? It seems like contradicting the human or humanitarian aspects of life, part of the progress. Because as the time goes, we are becoming more and more material. What is becoming more important is that matter seems to be becoming more and more important as the time goes. By matter I mean the wealth and fame and power. These things are becoming more and more important as the time goes. And if they become important, then the person becomes less and less important. And so people have lost importance in our mind because those things have become important. And I am sure that this was always the reason. But now that we are more affluent, there are more possibilities. You can achieve more. You can gratify ego more. So people are opting for that. Opting for ego gratification. Maybe hundred years ago, the opportunity to do was limited. Not that people didn't have ego, but then the opportunity was limited. As we are creating opportunities now, with technology and other things, now person has the option to take that option of gratifying the ego. So more you go for gratification of ego, more isolated you become. Basic values that way are changing somewhat because of communication because of opportunities, because of affluence, because of development. Now many more human beings can aspire to achieve things than what formerly they could. So that is what is showing up. This in India families are breaking apart. This is, there was an agricultural society hundred years ago where people had no choice. One plot of land was there the whole family sustained on that. They had to live together. Son cannot leave home, where will he go? But now, there is opportunity that he can go to Bangalore, Hyderabad, you know, from Mumbai he goes there, Hyderabad he goes there. So, that is why that now says, family is breaking apart. It's not breaking apart. It is now that there is an opportunity which people take. And now divorces are increasing. But now that because freedom is increasing. Formerly there was no choice. Woman had no, where will she go? When she leaves home as father, there is nowhere. They, they won't accept her back. And then she has to accommodate her regardless of what it is. But now even if her father is not there, if she can work, she can be independent. So when social freedom, economic freedom is there, People use that freedom. So you feel that the people are becoming, you know, now we are breaking apart, but that, that is always there. You, that somehow, artificially, they are all joined together. That is, so now, what is, what is, I mean, reality is happening, that's all it is. Because there is an opportunity to do that. That's one way of looking at it. Okay, right? Om Purnamada Purnamidam Purnat Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamada Ya Purnameva Vashishade Om Shanti 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 
हरि ओम श्री गुरुभ्यो नमः हरि ओम